Thank you all for coming. This is wonderful. Um, looking forward to some interesting questions uh, later on. Uh, I'm Adrian Kochman. I'm the curator. And this is Margot McMahon, uh, the organizer and inspiration for uh, this exhibit of her father's work, uh, Frank McMahon. Um, we've prepared kind of general questions. Uh, some talking points that I think are, would be kind of interesting for everyone to know, but I think it's kind of an overall introduction. Mark, I think we could just let you start on kind of what the, you know, uh, your father's uh, perspective on the exhibit, uh, what his philosophy was, um, and to just provide a general introduction. I'm aware that some of you probably know, know of his work quite well, but we will assume that not everyone is. So um, let's just start. Thank you very much. Franklin McMahon is my father. He was a uh, he started off as a cartoonist, and then was um, he en he enlisted himself into World War II um, <clears throat> before the draft. He was 21 years old, and he said, "I think I'd rather make a choice." So he trained to fly planes with the Navy and ended up um, in part of the big buildup in uh, uh, London uh, for uh, the final blast of the war associated with D-Day. So he ended up a navigator on this, his 16th flight with a troop he wasn't with, a battalion, and uh, was shot down over Germany. So he's 22 years old and this is his training uh, to parachute down into the most complicated places on earth. And he spent his life doing that. Um, he was in three POW camps, which I won't go into the details of, but you know about them from television and movies. Uh, Stalag Three, Great Escape, 13D, Hogan's Heroes, and then Wormach 7A that was built for 12, 1,200 prisoners, and there's 120,000. All Air Force, all concentrated next to Dachau, and that was the plan if they won, um, if the Germans won, was they couldn't feed them, so we'll exterminate them. So, and they were told that pretty much on a daily basis. So he had this kind of wiredness to um, go back while they're building the wall. He was there in 1961 and in 1964. And he was actually caught on the east side with a gun pointed at him again by an by a East German. Uh, and he said, I'm just a dumb American, let me go. So he knew how to slip out of that. And then during the 60s, he and my mother, with nine children at home, we were all cooking for each other, um, they went to the first Selma Montgomery march. This is a reenactment that he was able to draw in such detail. But once again, there's two parents with a lot of responsibility in the world, and they think this is the most important thing for them to do. And one of the philosophies was, he said this his whole life, there is nothing as permanent as change. And their job was to get the word out, to make change go in the right direction, to nudge society towards more justice. Dad did that through uh, his artwork, and Mom did that through her writing. And she also was encouraging him all the time when she couldn't go. Both of them in World War II were, were in the exact same airplane, but Mom was in the United States moving military and supplies around in the Stratoliner. The same airplane was reconfigured to the B-17 bomber. So both of them had this early 20s training of being in this really fearful place to for the cause. You know, it was the time of, you know, step up and, and be for the cause. And they kept that energy going their entire lives with their own interests. Um, we could talk about more specifics as we go, but there is nothing as permanent as change. And for the two steps forward we make sometimes towards justice, there's usually a step back. So it's keeping the pressure up towards the right direction. And that's what uh, my training was as a child. <laughs> Keep the pressure in the right direction. And it gets to be a dance like we were talking about where 
you put pressure on, you step back, you put pressure on, you step back. Um, but if it's uncomfortable, you're probably in the right place. Margo, I'm curious to know, uh, what was your mother's position? She, she enlisted. Well, she didn't she, enlist. She, no, she how was. was she yeah, so she had just finished um, te art teacher education and was certified the year that Congress cut the education bill. Uh, that year, that George Bush Sr. was in college, he only had to go to three years of college. Every high school student only went to three quarters of a day of high school, and then they went and worked in a factory or had jobs for the first time. And that was part of the um, getting the war done when all the men were gone. So everybody chipped in. She did not get a teaching job. She instead, with a couple of friends, including Mary Philbin from Oak Park, they went and became stewardesses for United Airlines. Now in 1938, there were two Boeing planes flying into Midway Airport. By 1941, there were 50,000. So who wouldn't be fascinated? All of a sudden, the skies are loaded. And they're all flying through Chicago to exchange mail, supplies, and um, refuel. So Midway Airport expanded exponentially. So both of them at this time, you know, thinking about those are my parents, they were on these star pattern takeoffs. Most of the pilots are 22, 25 years old. And one plane takes off this way, one takes off that way. In Dad's formations, they had to get all the planes in the air at the same time. So they're doing this in rapid succession, three, three intersecting um, uh, tarmacs, uh, runways. Runways. runways, thank you. And um, same thing at Midway Airport. So it took a lot of courage. Took a lot of you know, just get past it, and that training that they had in their youth carried them into stepping into these very volatile places. Um, my oldest brother told me about it. My father didn't hit the dining room table about being at the Marquette Park riot, and and that's where Martin Luther King said, "I've never seen such hate in all of my travels, and all I've seen in the South. There's not, been nothing like what I saw at Marquette Park." So they were, and Dad came home and showed us some drawings, but Matt really told me about how there were spiked balls with chains being thrown into the crowd. There was fire being thrown into people, you know, and, and the intent was jobs, I think. I think it was, if we let these blacks have any power, they'll take our jobs. But the, the extent and the anger of it was, Unbelievable. Did your brother accompany your father to Mark uh, Different Park? brothers went with dad on different trips. Um, I finally went on one as an adult to South Africa and helped him hang. He was 75 years old and he was going to go hang these 60 Vatican II paintings himself. And I'm like, I think I'm going with you. Mm -hmm. And so um, I went and we framed them there and hung them. And uh, then I came home, and somehow he got them back. I think he probably got help on the way back. But um, so, but my you know, one brother went on the Chicago Symphony Orchestra tour through Europe, and he was probably 17 or 18 years old and exhausted from the trip. And here, Dad was in his 60s and hard driving, and it's like he never ate, he never slowed down. He just had this amazing drive, and it, it was something from his early training that was quite remarkable. What was the purpose of your father bringing one of your one of the one of the children along on the trip? Was it educational? Was it? He included us all the time. Um, for instance, um, in that right around the Democratic Convention, mm -hmm. I was kind of right at the young end of the family, probably 11 years old. He brought all of us down, and we couldn't get into the Democratic Convention because it was barriered off. This is 1968. 1968. Yeah. Uh, and um, the day of the Battle of Michigan Avenue. Mm -hmm. And so we were in the Congress Hotel. And Dad was there drawing the politicians who were coming through. And this one chimpanzee, I was fascinated with this one chimpanzee. We were all just on our own, all over the place. Came in with a McCarthy hat on. 
and I was just kind of staring at it, and I tripped over this giant watch, and like, you know, one of those big, you know, metal watches, and I'm like, oh, somebody dropped this, and then the chimpanzee was gone as soon as I looked up, and I thought I'd have to return it, so I'm down the hall returning this watch to Lost and Found, and my brother comes running, and I, could, I just didn't even question, he goes, we have to go right now. And so he and I just ran out of the hotel, jumped in the van, was there with dad, everybody else. They had been looking for me for a while, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I we jump in, Mace is in the air already, and we start listening on the radio all the way home. And the, the Battle of Michigan Avenue had broke up. Um, the build up to that, so my research has been, what was that? You know, I lived it, he, he painted it, um, I would have definite moments, but the Friday before, there was a pig named Pegasus, named after the Chicago police because of what would happen already. And that was at McCormick Place, I think, when it was much smaller. And then, you know, um, Ginsburg was in Lincoln Park. The weather was really hot. The police were overworked. They weren't, be, they weren't given water. They weren't supported. They were out there for long days on their feet. So they were really angry and their, the boss, Mayor Daley, was telling them that we're not putting up with any of these kids. The city filled up with um, students for a democratic society that Mayor Daley had said, don't come, we don't want you here, which just inspired them to come more. And Ginsburg gave this kind of chanting, of, uh, um, kind of chanting in Lincoln Park. And the, you know, the bullhorns went off, we're closing the park, you gotta get out of here it's at 11 p.m. And he peacefully left. Well, then Monday happened and one more thing happened and the police are still there and they're hot, they're tired, they're thirsty. And then by, this was Monday or Tuesday, was the Battle of Michigan Avenue, they were worn out. They were tired. Um, the students were riled up because they had been mistreated. And now they're being dragged off of monuments and towering things that they're trying to just get up and, and shout their voice. And uh, it was a real collision of culture. So if we can bridge those gaps by coming together, and being a larger voice peacefully, we have made amazing change happen. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want this to be, as a guide to one voice, one person, like my two parents went, leaving nine kids at home to be a voice at the Selma Montgomery March. We just have to be the republic that, is make, that makes up the United States. It's the republic of the people that the Greeks talked about. And that is what makes change, the peacefulness of it, the, the gathering, the ideas becoming larger together, and this kind of a conversation that all of us, I assume, have been involved in, in one way, shape, or form. What led you, I imagine there are probably other works also that are not here. What kind of works are those? What led you to select these? and kind of leave the others behind for now. So that goes back to a little bit of history, but I was really inspired to put this exhibit together in 2018 for political reasons. Um, but also, it, it, so I have to go to my cheat sheet here because uh, we've had that sheltering in place black hole of memory <laughs> that just has happened. But in 2018, there were 50 paintings, including the conspiracy trial with this, um, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act. Since that time, uh, National HUD has taken FAIR out of that title. What does that mean? I don't know. But the Fair Housing Act came out of Chicago as well with um, Lorraine Hansberry's uh, Raisin in the Sun play. That that was a story of redlining that was extreme in Chicago. So to have that being shown and celebrated again was important. Then in 2019 through 2020, Resist was the inaugural exhibit at the Lake Forest Lake Bluff History Center for the 50th anniversary of the Chicago Conspiracy Trial. So these things that Dad was drawing were huge um, media events in Chicago, lots of memory around them, and they refer to things that are happening today. 
So people are trying to churn up that memory of we've been here before. Then in 2020 to 2022, the, the conspiracy trial part of the exhibit was at the Pritzker Law Library of Northwestern University. Since, Resist was exhibited at Euclid Church at Oak Park, um, the Oak Park History Museum, and now here at the Ukrainian Institute of Modern Art. So it is important. Uh, it's, we have been in a time of resist. We've been in a time of protest from two very diverse and troubled sides of our country. Um, the numbers don't pan out, but the anger and division does. And at one point, I've heard it was said that we've been in this constant state of the division that was right before the Civil War. And somehow we've been able to maintain and not have it break out, but we've seen a lot of ugly things in the last few years, if not the last few days. Really, really awful things that should never happen. Absolutely. What has it been like to, to go back and try to learn more about your father's work and, and uh, even the backstories of some of these images? Well, it, it is disturbing, um, kind of like the Battle of Michigan Avenue. Um, I didn't know, you know what I was in at the time, and it was, I was too young to really contemplate it or understand it. Um, the war was very, very disturbing. No wonder they didn't tell us anything. Even when they came back from the Selma Montgomery march. How awful is that? You are seeing our tax paid leaders pummeling our citizens only for the vote. I mean, this is a simple thing that should never have not happened in the first place. Mm -hmm. And that vote was well established in the 1800s, <laughs> if not before. Right. So that this is an ongoing battle and that that march is a reenactment every single year to remind us that everybody has the right to vote and we're still fighting for it. And that was a very volatile part right before the Civil War as well. Um, people didn't want other people to vote and worked very hard. Chicago is an example of a terrible equality of voters. You know, there was a lot of um, paying for votes and, and bullying for votes. And, you know, so we, see, we have seen this all the way through, but the democracy is holding because people come together. Mm -hmm. Because people come together with a voice. And there's much more tolerance for it. And now we see it in places like China that they're really punished for having a voice together. But they have to do something. There is one painting, uh, the pinkish one, down there where um, those are murals that um, in the 60s, uh, Dad was always bringing us down, Mom and Dad were always bringing us down to see, I'll, I'll point it out. When you don't have a voice, you will find a way for a voice. And these are the murals that were down at Pilsen and the South Side, painted on the side of a building. So if you can't get in the newspaper, you can't get a byline, you can't write a book, you can't get published, paint on your walls. Find a board to paint on and walk around with it. Just kind of get your message out there. Now we have you know, Third Coast Press, which is the oldest black press in the United States, that was, came out of the South Side Art Center, was supported by Gwendolyn Brooks. And whenever they were at the brink of uh, going under, she would just write a check for whatever they needed. And sh so she was in that way you know, she was always an activist, but it was through her writing was the loudest voice she could give. And then she allowed that voice for other people as well. So that is from the um, marginalized mm -hmm. places. There will be a way. Right now we have graffiti everywhere. I personally love seeing it because some kid needs to say something. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm sure it's, you know, thousands and millions of dollars of painting over it, but it's fantastic art. And I, you know, it's, it's good to have a vehicle to have, you know, go along the 606 line in a kind of contained way, but at the same time, I love seeing it everywhere. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it kind of uh, lets you know what's going on in that neighborhood. 
maybe. Yeah. Like what someone has to say, it's almost, yeah. Yeah, and the bubble letters are like bursting with sound, like say it loud, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Make it, you know, full and, and, and pressing against the space against you. Mm -hmm. So I think that art heals for the oppression that is happening and has happened forever and will happen, mm -hmm. but that bubble letter pressing out against the oppression is a, a, a healing thing. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, we were, before we started, we were talking about the other exhibit and how it kind of balances this one out, the children's war art. And in talking right now about how you didn't know that much about what your parents were or had experienced or even what happened in Selma when they went, do you think they were trying to protect you as children? I think they were really busy. I mean, just three meals a day was a lot. <laughs> and, you know, getting us in shoes. And, you know, there was just, they were really busy. And they put everything into my journalism. So both of them studied with Laszlo Moholy Naj in 1945. Before they were married, they went to the lectures at the Institute of Design, which is now a nightclub at um, Ontario and Dearborn, I think. The big stone building it used to be a public library then it was Institute of Design. When the Institute of Design merged with um, IIT um, and uh, the two Bauhaus uh, instructors, Mies van der Rohe and Laszlo Moholy-Nagy, that became the Bauhaus of mm -hmm. Chicago. So in that training, Dad learned to get out there in the street, see what's going on, because Laszlo did that, and project your work in, onto society somehow. Get it into society so that society knows what this artist thinks. So the coaxial cable for TV didn't come. That was in 47. And Laszlo Moholy Naj died that year, or 48, right around there. The coaxial cables with television didn't come till 1949. So what was Laszlo Moholy Naj thinking? There was no TV, there was, there was film, and there was no internet, but now we see it happening all over the place through the internet, and now we have this explosion of, you know, do we keep Twitter, do we let Twitter, Twitter go, you know? It's like, how can we keep this a safe place for kids, mm -hmm. for adults, um, so that it's not um, broadcasting Freedom of speech is really different than what this cry is for freedom of hate. And I am thinking that freedom of hate is a louder voice right now than the freedom of speech. So that is what the Twitter conversation is about right now. And I, um, the owner doesn't get it. Right, absolutely, yeah. I'm thinking, you know, would anyone like to ask questions? You kind of laid a lot out there. And Speaking of doing three meals a day and putting shoes on nine pairs of feet, um, who were your father's clients? Who hired him to do this kind of visual journalism? So it was a combination. For the Emmett Till trial, that article that's at the end, he was hired by Life magazine to go down to Sumner, Mississippi in 1955 to cover the trial with, that happened within a month of the lynching. And so to do that, he had a little sketch pad about this big that he drew in like he was a reporter, like he was writing notes, with the, and he sat in the reporter section. And then he brought that little drawing back to his hotel room, and he made it this size, 16 by 20 size. Mm -hmm. Then he took those artworks, and, he, and life had a really strict deadline. Mm -hmm. He had to get those mailed in snail mail mm -hmm. to New York to an apartment to smuggle it up. So he couldn't be caught with the artwork on the street. And he was harassed going out for cups of coffee. You northerners, well, you should be going home now, don't you think, kind of thing. And but he, so he always walked with a buddy. Uh, but he got the news out four months later. Rosa Parks didn't get up from the black section of the bus 
and that started the bus boycott and the civil rights movement. So by smuggling out those stories, it gave enough encouragement to start this path. Um, Dr. Martin Luther King was getting his doctorate at the time and he was pulled off it. You've got to come now and start this movement. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it was a big moment. Um, and then another example. Um, oh yeah, so then fast forward, well, just a year or two. He's now in trouble with McCarthyism. And, you know, he's one of those guys to watch out for. Many of his friends were already blacklisted. And here he is, got nine kids to feed, and uh, somehow he's got to figure this out. So what does he do? Waits till I'm born in 1957, waits till I'm old enough, five months old or four months old, and he moves us all to Spain because Cyril paid him to paint the beginning of a factory in Morocco. Cyril uh, Pharmaceutical, S-E-A-R-L-E, -E. Pharmaceutical. They were building a factory in Morocco. So we all moved to, to around um, Toro Molinos, or Mount Malaga Bay, the town of Toro Molinos. And he thought at the time, I might have to live here forevermore. Franco, Spain, of all places to move your kids. <laughs> you know, it's like out of the frying pan, into the fire. So, but Franco hated um, communists. So he was kind of certifying himself non-communist by doing that. And he also decided with the, he couldn't keep his business going from Spain because the mail was terrible. The banking system was terrible. I mean, everything took half a day to, to cash a check. And I know all this from letters that he sent back to Graham. This is what my day was. <laughs> I stepped out to just cash a check, and it took me four hours. You know, so he couldn't really function that way. And so a year later, we moved back. But the two oldest uh, brothers in my family were at the British school, and the rest of us were all preschoolers. I was an infant. So that was, you know, how kind of how it went, and they weren't afraid to step up and move to a new country, even with the whole parcel of us. And was your mother getting employment as a journalist writer? Well, she, yeah, so then the next trip, uh, what, one thing Dad wrote back to Graham in those notes was, we just can't take all these kids again. <laughs> this is too hard, you know? So the next time I got X'd out, and they did a road trip with a travel magazine to the uh, canal that was opening up to open up the Great Lakes for commerce. And, um, so that was up um, upstate New York, where my family's originally from, which I also knew nothing about. And, uh, but I discovered a lot about that as well. So they took half the family. The rest of us were kind of farmed out um, to different people that we knew. Um, and uh, that's kind of how they traveled from that point on. I spent a lot of weeks at my cousin's house. My uncle welcomed me as the orphan every time. <laughs> Do you want to tell us how did your uh, father gain access to the Emmett uh, Till trial? He was smuggling out information. How was he admitted in the first place? He would get press passes for all of these things. So a lot of them he did on his own, mm -hmm. uh, or he did it for the Catholic Church magazines. But he had a like he had a um, reporter's pass from Life magazine. Um, the New York Times, Chicago Tribune. He, he covered the conspiracy trial with the Chicago Tribune press pass. That gave him a front row seat. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, the movie that came out, there is an actor who acts, him, acts as him, um, and he was in the front row with two other um, conspiracy trial artists. Uh, one's name was Andy, it was a her, but the, in the movie, uh, they depicted her as a him <laughs> with the name Andy. Mm -hmm. So they didn't research that closely, but they did have a pretty good likeness of Dad in the actor. So he had front row seats to all of us, you know, and here we have it because of his witness. Was he in Apollo something? Which Apollo? Which oh yeah, he was in the Apollo 11 movie as well. His, they actually dug up him drawing in the control booth 
as the uh, astronauts are working, are landing, or I forgot exactly, but um, but they have him actually drawing that um, has been in the Apollo archives, and they use that in the movie. So he was a freelancer. He was <coughs> not on the staff of the Chicago Tribune. Right, he was a freelancer, and uh, the reason that all of this. Well, one of the reasons there's so much artwork is he made movies from his art, once again from Las Loma Molinage projecting it on society. Um, so he needed a lot for each frame. It was, it was animated and the photographer would zoom in and out and pan across and while mom interviewed people and that was the sound that was used, um, sound of actually being there in the moment. Um, he was a freelancer. Uh, but he had his regular places he could go. So, and the deal with the Tribune, which is different now, is if you have published in the Tribune, you could keep the copyright and the artwork. Now, the Tribune says, we own the copyright if we've published it. So he could not have had all this work uh, today, uh, but he, we do have it now for the 50 years. So there is a lot of other work. Um, this is, uh, getting back to your original question, the major categories of Dad's work are world studio, that's the rebuilding of the world after the wars, world religion, that covers uh, Vatican II and how it, it, the, the priests started to turn around and face the constituency and include Japan in the conversation and Africa in the conversation and South America in the conversation that had never been listened to in the history of the Catholic Church. So that was Vatican II. Uh, politics, he covered from Eleanor Roosevelt through Hillary Clinton, every Dukakis, Babbitt, everyone who made it and everyone who didn't, uh, with all the um, uh, primaries and the conventions. So I think we have um, uh, Jimmy um, Carter's convention there with the balloon drop great celebration and a great contrast on that wall between Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan. It's a lot of goes one way and then it goes the other. Uh, and then the space race. Uh, he was a pilot. He was fascinated in the space race and has shown a lot of his work at the um, Aeronautics Museum of the Smithsonian and has a lot collected there. Culture. He covered the Chicago Symphony Orchestra tour through Europe as it was becoming a world-class um, orchestra with Sir George Schulte. Uh, he also covered their tour through Japan. And then sports. Um, I have a lot of paintings of black athletes on trial <laughs> for something that happened along the way. Um, he covered uh, sailing uh, in Acapulco. He covered um, football. and He didn't do car racing but football and baseball, and that was for Sports Illustrated. So he had a lot of mouths to feed, and he worked very hard to do that by publishing his work in magazines and newspapers. Marco, where was uh, his real work shown? The films, the footage, was that? Uh, CBS uh, showed American City at Christmas Time. And in American City at Christmas time, he showed, you know, the Christmas trees and the singing, but he also showed Jesse Jackson at the jail, saying, chanting, we are somebody, we may be poor, we may be unemployed, but we are somebody. So he got the whole realm of what society is, the, the good, the bad, the sad of the holidays. Um, and WTTW, um, showed a lot of his films, uh, PBS. They were shown in theaters, and now films are being made that include him. He has several Emmy Awards and Peabody Awards for the films. So he's been well acclaimed. He would, he would say, oh yeah, we're going out. They'd be in their gown and tuxedo, and why don't you turn on the awards tonight and see what happens. You know, we'd kind of get an assignment, not knowing where they were going. And then we'd see him get an award. It's like, well, that's where they are. <laughs> so they had a way of not really, yeah. Can't they be viewed through the archives? Thank you very much. Yes, right now, the whole collection is at the Chicago Film Archives. And you can watch um, any one of these films. 
Uh, the artist reporter is him telling his own story of this field that he created. And he taught at Syracuse University while living in Chicago and taught many people to take on this way of going out on the street and documenting your time, being a chronicler of what is going on because it's far more fascinating than what you'll invent in your own studio. <laughs> You had a, your hand up some oh, time I ago. Did. You may have actually answered it, but I kind of wanted to, I'm not sure I know how best to formulate the question, but there are, let's say, exemplary lives we look at because they teach us about a particular time. And then there are representative people who live in a time and we just want to see how they lived in a time. And then there are the artist chronicles, which you just touched on, and they bear witness in a way. I think Vicky used the word, or you did in response to Vicky's question, and then someone else just touched on it, right? So you have this notion of bearing witness. But there's also, you have this personal relationship. So I'm interested, you're clearly more progressive tilt. Uh, in a contemporary dialogue, you look around and you see things. Does that come from your father? Was he a chronicler only, or was he politically conscious and deliberate in the choices he made about what he recorded, what he chose to witness and then put on paper? Great question. Um, so I have selected this art from a lot. Uh, I also had a couple year exhibit of Ronald Reagan paintings of his out in where Reagan is from, western suburbs, far western yes. suburbs. Dixon. Dixon. Dixon, yeah. It was at, a, um, it was in the, the community center there and then it was also in a gallery there. He was fascinated with Ronald Reagan. He would sit in front of the news every night and yell at him. <laughs> but he was fascinated with him and he, we have a huge body of work of Ronald Reagan who has created this form of democracy we have now. Or he was the front and the form of democracy we have now is started then. So he tried to be a journalist as best he could and show both sides equally to, to give credibility to his work. So in that way, he chronicled his time from one artist's perspective, but as a reporter. He's surrounded by reporters. He's in the culture of being a reporter. He has to show both sides of it. Um, but as I'm uncovering these stories, I am seeing them as a symbol of the greatest generation. They lived through the Dust Bowl. They lived through two depressions, two major depressions uh, economically. Um, they, um, they saw uh, integrated neighborhoods that they grew up in in Chicago, and they saw those segregated after World War II and fought against that. Um, these are things that this generation saw, these changes happening, and who is doing this? And how did this happen uh, well, uh, during our time? I feel the same way. How did this happen during our time? We're watching, and we still can't keep it in the right direction. You know, so um, this definitely is a thin slice of what his whole body of work is, but I think it's an important one for our time. Uh, and since 2018, we have had protests on both sides of this very uh, challenging discussion of what is right. And the words are used, the flag is used as symbols on both sides to where it almost has no meaning because it means totally different things. And so uh, I felt like somehow we have to remember it's us coming together and having a single voice, if only for an afternoon, for our own mental health and for to get the message out there in a stronger way. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, I think it sort of follows up on that. I'm wondering how you think about the uh, violent, quote unquote, violent and non violent aspects of protest. I was in Slovenia, very influenced by Martin Gandhi, etc. And now, especially for the last two years, the like the quote unquote violence of, of protest is so heavily politicized, especially in the media with the words, images, language, audio, video, etc. So how do you think art helps us distinguish between the two and what place does that have? I guess my 
Well, I think this is a symbol of peaceful protest. Violence did happen there, but the violence wasn't told to us. The, I, I didn't know about Market Park other than my brother telling me, even though it happened that day and I came home from school and that was the, the dinner table conversation. Dad wouldn't say that. He would, he would put Martin Luther King, the peaceful leader who learned from Gandhi how to make change happen peacefully. And the other thing that was really important that is still a struggle is the segregation of race or the integration of races. And that was the discussion going on through this. Um, and whether it's people can live ha more happily. And this is like Douglas and Lincoln saying the same thing. You know, we're still in that. Are people going to be more happy in their own neighborhoods? Or are people going to be more happy learning from each other and a richer diversity of life? And so I hope that people see this show and come away with change gets more effectively moved in the right direction through peaceful protest. But us coming together is important for that protest. Thank you. Uh, Vicky or? Kind of diverting a little bit from the American focus and on a macro level, knowing your dad's past and his involvement in the war, and obviously what's going on in Ukraine today, tying it into where we're at right now, how do you think he would view what's going on over there and his approach to documenting what is happening, given kind of his approach to, I guess, more internal conflicts with the US and I guess, do you also think that looking at the way that, you know, democracy is being jeopardized there, you know, what his approach would be if you were covering today? I'm going to answer one part of that okay. from what his friend, who he made movies with, said from California just a month ago. He said, Margo, what are you doing? You should be out figuring out what, who QAnon is and who the, you know, who that, and that's what your dad would be doing. And uh, so he would dive into what is, who are the leaders of the conflict and understand that and try and put that into his artwork. So he really did a whole lot of study and research of this. Um, he's a chronic news watcher, reader. You know, he was really in there as a reporter doing investigative kind of things. Now, the, uh, I was, while you were asking the question, I was thinking of which protest we are we talking about China, which is like, yeah, they have to do something. They've been cooped up for so many months and, tra and trapped. And they had this internal freedom where if you bought a $500 or something ticket, you could fly all over inside of China for a year, which was kind of an amazing freedom. But then all of a sudden it became the exact opposite. And that is really, you know, I don't know with what our restrictions were and how weird coming out of it is. People are acting weird, dogs are acting weird, you know, just strange things are happening. Um, you know, you, to have that extreme in China, I don't know how people are coping. So the protest is coming out of that. It's just, you have to do something. And if you can do it along the way, in a peaceful way, you're venting, you're hopefully making change until it gets all pent up and then that's when it becomes violent. So hopefully people's voices are being heard on the walls, however they can, with graffiti before it becomes too much. Yeah. Hi, yes, so uh, on your last point, uh, will it be fair to say that your father's heart is uh, given that those kind of voice and kind of uh, being a peacekeeper and letting people know that the struggles of those times were valid. So to show proof, so that those coming after him could be so sort of a storyteller type of thing. Would that be uh, something that would be? Uh, Thank you so much. I think you said that so well. Um, uh, one, one kind of wild card painting that it reminds me of is the 
um, Tuskegee Institute in the corridor, and we could have placed that at the beginning, we, anywhere. And um, Booker T. Washington Monument is in the front, and the, the Institute is building, it's growing. There's, there's more to it. And um, it goes back to the first painting, or the first drawing here. Uh, the Tuskegee Airmen were in the same POW camp as Dad, the surviving Tuskegee Airmen. So he was, he knew them from service in the war. And a lot of these real tough struggles happened post-World War II, where this community moves here. We built you a nice new building on match factory soil, but live here. This community will give you funding to go build the suburbs, and you move out there. Somehow we have to take care of this turbulent chaos that's in Chicago of every farm boy moving into the city and every uh, airman stopping through Chicago and saying, I like the city, I'll live here. I mean, it was the schools were a 500% increase after World War II. Yeah, that's how many 25 year olds were coming back and starting their education. So uh, somehow the government had to decide things and they decided them in a very unjust way and uh, created redlining or enhanced the redlining that was already here. Thank you. Thank you. I think you said it really well. I'm going back to process and how he did his art and what his media were. Um, you described using a reporter's notebook in the Until example and then flushing out in a larger picture um, for an assignment at Wild and so tell me. Did he ever um, use photography of an event and then take a picture, uh, you know, fill it out later? Yeah, so this is um, Camden, New Jersey, mm -hmm. after a big protest. And um, what I love about it is the building there, uh, Walt Whitman was from, Cam um, from Camden. Shot down a little background on it first, sorry. Uh, and Walt Whitman, Bar Khan told me, is from Fort, had his house on Fourth Avenue. That's Fourth Avenue and Nichols Street. Um, and there was first, I'm not sure I have the order right, but a black man killed, followed by a Hispanic man killed, and they just level the whole area with protests. Um, but I, I have to read you what this says. This is Walt Whitman's poem that's on the city hall. In a dream, I saw a city invincible. And this is what we see. This is a downtown area of Camden and with the riots that was blown out. The other wall says, right makes might. Um, so, but why I point this one out is here, he wrote in here, yellow, sandy soil. And over here is green something, and then there's pink, and then there's yellow. So he drew this like, like the black and white drawings, and then he took a picture with, you know, a little, at that point, a brownie camera or something, and then he used that back in the studio to paint the color. And did he use mostly watercolor? He started with watercolor, and then he moved to acrylic, along with every other artist in the world, because it had supposedly a greater longevity. I see. And you can also use colored pencils, right? No. No? No, it's all paint. He had very, I have a few of his paintbrushes. They are very thin. All so of that. He was also using a pen here? He was using a paintbrush for the black lines? Yeah, so lines? oh, he used very black pencils okay. and Arches 100 pound paper all the time. Okay. And he usually had a bundle of them, 20 of them. And he sharpened them with a um, flat edge razor. Um, one-sided razor. Mm -hmm. And so the, raz the razors were all over our house, too. <laughs> we, they didn't worry about what kids worry about today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that could have been the title. Razors everywhere. <laughs> but, I was just wondering if it was pen and ink, but you're telling me it was pencils. Those are all pencils. I see. Yeah, very black pencil. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you know, I came back from art school, and I would do this shading, find the picture in the line work and start with a really hard pencil and build out darker, darker. He goes, forget all that, Margo. Just put the pencil on the paper and draw. And that is really what is amazing about his work. He had such confidence in that. He had such need to draw what it's like to walk in to a concentration camp. 
In his case, he experienced it going into a POW camp, but nobody knew what was ahead of him as they went through those gates. They just saw a lot of barbed wire. And you could see the intensity of that. And he needed to get that emotion through the pencil on the paper. And also, great, he didn't paint it. I mean, how do you dress that up? You know, it's just black and white. Can I tell a story? The location for George Bush's uh, campaign rally in 1988, Bush won in a suburban mall up in Libertyville. And he had a little car and steering wheel, and he just put this pad up against it with pencil. And in 15 minutes, I, he literally filled in the entire drawing. Um, in the car. In the car. The it's raining. Mm -hmm. you know, just kind of the average day. It's a rainy day. And he just, and, it, and he, the entire, he, I later saw it as a complete painting, but it was done in 20 minutes. <laughs> So that training came from when he was a cartoonist. He was sending cartoons back to Chicago while he was in POW camp. And there were flyers that dropped out of airplanes saying that if any commandant or guard mistreats you as a POW, they will be tried individually later. Now the Nuremberg trial negated that later. But he was always drawing the guards that were the nasty guards. And they had this thing called V-mail at the time where they would take his drawings and cartoons and take a photograph of them, the canister would be sent back to the United States. And they would print it there and send it to my grandmother. And then she distributed it to the, the uh, magazines that he was doing cartooning for. So he was able to smuggle out these images for later legal <coughs> trials, which I think gave him that interest in the trials, too. Which begs the question, I'm sorry, interject this one, maybe a practical matter. How did they smuggle them out? Were there sympathetic guards? Were there people in the villages near the POW camps that would be willing to take these away? Or? Well, I think that his drawings went out unredacted. Every letter, letter had all kinds of black lines through it because they couldn't give location. So words were censored, but images were not. So he was just sending letters? Well, he sent letters home too, but when the, every single letter had to be read by someone and then cross out like, oh, we just went by um, Dachau, you know, well, that would give the, that would give away a clue as to where his troop was or whatever. Um, so that would be markered out. But well, actually, your description then points to something I was going to point out anyway, right? Which is that the POW camps in which your father was a prisoner were by an order of magnitude more uh, civil and more organized than just war camps that were concentration camps or extermination gas chamber. Etc. So there was this kind of awkward hierarchy of prison with gypsies and Jews and gays and so on at the bottom, but combatants were considered higher than that. Right? And he was an officer. So officers, it was, he said it was good and bad to be an officer. I'm not sure what the bad part was, but you had a lot of, um, for instance, when he was in Stalag 3, he could get art equipment, watercolors. Um, he did paintings there. Uh, he had an art community there. There were a lot of cartoonists. And some drawings, a lot of the artists were sending things back to Disney. And some of them went and worked for Disney, including the interrogator, Shakun. He went back and did mosaics in Disneyland. He was on the German side. So, but he was a kind interrogator. He would buy beer for the, for the POWs. He, you know, so they were living an okay life at Stalag 3, even though there wasn't enough food. They were basically hungry. But they had plays, they had sports, they had golf. Um, they had a lot of freedom there. They were digging up roots for you know, heating the cabins. It was cold. Coldest winter in Germany to date. So that was a lot to survive. I, I guess kind of too where I was going with that is this notion of bearing witness to history. This 
notion of being a witness and recording. All of this is a record of great good fortune as well, because he actually survived. Yeah, that was the important part, because he had to carry all his cartoons back with him. And some got mailed back, but he had to survive. And that's where mom comes in, because uh, he proposed to her from one of these POW camps. She never got it through the mail. And he never knew, but somehow that kept him going. And she would send him notes, and he, he had one of those notes in his scrapbook um, from her. Just, and it's very simple, one line on a note card, because you really couldn't pass that much back and forth. But she was very important in his survival. And him not taking too many risks, too. He kind of sensed and heard, this is the end of the war. Uh, I think I'll just stay in the middle of everything and everybody and not try and escape. Even though they tried to escape every day. Oh, that was another huge thing, going back to the beginning of all this. He's in that moment where his plane is on fire. The incendiaries are, are exploding inside the plane. The plane has already gone in, and Jeff has told me when it started to spin, they couldn't get out of the plane. So I didn't know that before. And so all of a sudden, the co-pilot pulls up on something in the right order and writes the plane. So it's still on fire. Dad has to decide, is he going to take the 45 pistol, which is the size of a gangster pistol, or uh, the silk map? And in that second or two, he grabs the silk mat and says, I'm not gonna shoot my way out of Germany, I'll leave the pistol. So he puts that into the sleeve of his coat. But on the drop, you, you count to one 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000, all the way to 10 1,000 to get away from a burning plane before you open your parachute. So he's doing this count, and so that's a free fall through 35 degrees below zero. And his boot flies off. And so now he's landing in Germany without a boot. And there's no boots left. And if you get a cut, you're not healthy enough for the cut to recover. So that's for, for sure you're going to die. This is all in the memoir. Yeah, sorry. So I get lost in some of these stories. No, no, no it's fine. I just wanted to. Yeah, so. Um, it is in there. And uh, so these are kind of the disturbing things that I discover. It kind of gives me the shakes a little bit. Uh, how much it was for a 22 year old. And as my kids went past their 22nd year, I'm like, oh my God, your life is so good. <laughs> you know, you have, to, you have to get a paper in on Friday, you know. Um, so it kind, of, it kind of levels everything a little bit. Um, uh, so anyway, he traded the silk map, I think, this is where I have to imagine some of it, um, for a boot, and that saved his life. And he had to make decisions because he's got to get back to Irene. So that's the important part. Yeah? So um, finally, it seems like your, your parents and dad's legacy <clears throat> isn't just his artwork and writing, but also, didn't they also raise children, some of whom became artists, maybe grandchildren too, I don't know. We all had a studio at home. Um, and All nine? Every one of us had a studio. Oh, wow. It was a big house. Um, and so everybody had their own space besides sharing a bedroom. Um, and I have this one picture of all of us. I'm the littlest, like three or four years old. And we all have our artwork in our hands. We went down to the Artist Guild and we showed our art, and Santa Claus gave us a gift. Mm -hmm. And everybody won first place for something. <laughs> so we did that every Christmas. And, and we would start like in September, and start making art like from school or whatever for it. But how that panned out was, I get to fourth grade, and there was a nun who just should have retired earlier. She just was not, <laughs> not all together. She had a, she had a, um, uh, oxygen mess that she taught through and you know so it was kind of rough but she had me stand up there and told me that I should be ashamed of myself that I had made this painting when I was from a famous family of artists and how can I make such a bad painting oh my so it's kind of like first of all what you know what is that all about 
So Dad said, come on, we're going to take this painting and we're going to show it at the Arts Guild. So I went and I won first place and got a great prize from Santa Claus. And, and it was just a great lesson. Do many of you, did you then do that for careers, most, of you, most or all of you? Every, uh, well, no, um, there's two who would call themselves the black sheep of the family. One went into geology and she uh, started finding water in Texas through geology and now she teaches geology. Um, but she also worked for a gas company looking for gas as well. So she, so I went to her office in, in Houston and it looked exactly like my drawing board at um, uh, World Book Encyclopedia. Big drawing board, a lot of colors, and she was drawing in color all the different lines of stratification from the coring. And I would be drawing, you know, how a hurricane was made. <laughs> so we, I felt like she was doing a very similar thing. Yes? Hi, I'm Bill with a friend. So um, I don't think my label is going to be very educational, but I'll do my best. <laughs> did your father, your father, did he do all of these or was it a collection from other people that he knew? Uh, did he do all of the art? Well, he did all of the paintings here and thousands more. And he traveled how many different states or countries? countries. Yeah, I think he, I think one of the very last countries that he went to was Ireland. He said, I don't have much interest in going to Ireland. But he had been in every other country in the world, I think. Um, so his interest really was the rebuilding of the world. Also, um, what I learned in my research was every one of these POW camps was the entire world concentrated together. They were all living together, and they were from Australia and New Zealand, and um, not so much South America, I don't think, but the whole world was there. And so he felt a part of that by having that intensive experience, which would also lead into his philosophy of integration is so much better than segregation, because everybody learns something from each other. And you have a richer life with it. Uh, and uh, a humanitarian. Yeah. And I, you know, th that was a lot of their uh, co combined marriage. They were life partners in their work and in their marriage. And mom grew up with Saul Alinsky's organizing techniques in high school. And Dorothy Day was her hero. So she really went with those philosophies, which also gave her the courage to say, yes, go into that great riot going on. And that great, you know, most of these, he thought he was going to a protest and it turned into a riot. Um, so, uh, but it was important, it was important to capture that this is how society nudges the world towards justice. It's by people coming together. Yeah, we definitely, he was definitely to hear the integration of art and form and poetry and conversation. And it's not just a one group, two group. We need, we need to hear. We need to hear all of it. And well, there are a lot of different voices and facets coming into the civil rights movement. And he was one that was consistent through it all. So I will tell you the story. Um, at kind of in the early 90s when my kids were tiny, so I was like pretty much just in the living room watching them. Mom kept telling me about this friendship with Gwendolyn Brooks. And they were doing a lot with her, along with Bob Carmody, Bob and Alice Carmody, the three, the five of them would you know, get together and do different things. And um, so our book group, uh, Jeff and Ann are here, we uh, read some Gwendolyn Brooks a couple years ago, and Barb Kahn brought in a book. The last book that Gwendolyn Brooks wrote and published was dedicated to my dad. So that was, they really came together and they were doing through their art a similar thing and, and finally met you know, later in life and at the end of her life. 
So that's the kind of things that are like so surprising to discover. Oh yeah, yeah. the media doesn't really show us all that. We have to go out and do the footwork. I constantly. It is a constant, constant effort, and you know why we don't ease up on, why we can't ease up on this at some point is hard. And I will say, I've been involved in a lot, and I've not been involved in a lot. You know, there's a lot of times I have something else I have to do, and I, you know. I'm disappointed in myself that I haven't been as steady with it as I could have been. But at the same time, you know, we have to all step up and do what we can when we can. One last thing. How, how old were you following when you went into concentration camp or born into concentration camp? And how old was you when you died? Or was he in the So it was 22, you said? When 22, let's see, he's born in 21, he's shot down in 45, 23? 23 years old. 23 when he was shot down in 45. Yeah, and, and he, he, passed, passed, he passed away at 91. Oh. Wow. Yeah, and he was drawing up till about 89 years old. So was he in a concentration camp? Yeah, so. So thank you very much, Elena. So this, there's a, there's a lot of drawings that I don't have in here. Um, meetings for gay rights, meetings for women rights. Um, that was the first painting he gave me right at the end of Shirley Chisholm, who was running for president. Um, and he said, this is the last woman to run for president, definitely with a double in one early there. <laughs> that there will be another, but this is the last one who did. But look where we end up at the end of the exhibit. We've got Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, two excellent candidates for President of the United States. And they're congenial at, um, and they're debating and they're respectful of each other and they have come through these years and they have come through the, you know, the opposition of voices. And um, it's just, we've come somewhere and we have a long way to go. Um, so um, let's take the lessons uh, from this as a guide and move forward and stay together to make change happen peacefully. So that's what I'm hoping comes out of this. And just, you know, because I'm a bear of little brain, when I walk around, are these numbers on the wall going to connect me to the description that kind of curates the exhibit? So There's a list at the, at the front. It's chronological for the most part. Every now and then there's a Tuskegee painting that could go anywhere, or uh, there's a few of them that, um, so this is basically 1960s, time of great change. And then we get to where we still believe in the news, and then we don't anymore. But uh, in Nancy Pelosi's documentary that is out now on TV, um, you just have to talk into your wand and find out. She said the very worst thing we did was the Iraq War. And that wall is dedicated to our big mistake over this period of time. There's a lot of mistakes, but that one was a big one. And uh, so right in the middle, George Bush is down walking on the golf course, George W. Bush. And there are three guys in the, in the front who were had to go through security to come to see him. And so they wore t-shirts, L, I, A, and R. And then they lined up to spell liar to tell him what they thought. You've got to just get the message out there somehow. And the more, you know, if you've got to be clever, you've got to be clever. You know, it's interesting, I'd be interested in your perspective on this. You said that when we do this, we reify history. So you said the 1960s was a time of great change. And then you snap to the Iraq War. And I find myself thinking every year is a time of great change. But we tend to somehow associate the 60s because we remember the images, visual images of protests and so on. But there's plenty of massive epochal changes happening in the present that deserve attention and interpretation and chronicling. Who's doing the work of your father now? Is it happening on social media, Instagram? I mean, who, who do you look to now as exemplifying your father's principles? Do you? Well, um, I'm going to go back a little bit to Laszlo Moholy-Nagy. 
he would have been all about Instagram uh, reels. Um, Dad would have been out there with social media to directly make some change with messaging. Um, although his films were like hour long, so he really could get into them with a lot more detail than these instant messages that we have popping up all the time. Which, do they really sink in? I don't know. Um, do, we, do we get a full newspaper article anymore? I don't think so. Do, do, you know, we're just getting to one or two paragraphs on anything and barely able to focus on those because something else is coming in, flashing up on the side of the screen while we're reading it. So our attention span is so very, very, very thin down. Um, uh, so I do have a brother who paints in his style and he does go out there and do some things like him. Um, not uh, with the same intensity, but he's got a great sense of humor with his work too. And another one, another brother in New York who also is, he carves pumpkins, but he is, carves them for the White House and for, um, oh, it's a woman in Connecticut, uh, Martha Stewart and Martha Stewart Television. And so, and he does political messages through those. Um, uh, and they are really kind of internationally shown, I guess. Um, well, there's some pumpkins. Yeah, I know, it's kind of funny, but it's kind, kind of amazing what he gets across in a pumpkin. But I guess that is the larger question, isn't it? It gets back to whether art can have a meaningful, enduring impact today the way it did perhaps 50, 60, even 30 years ago. Or is that now relegated to social media, Instagram? I mean, Twitter and Instagram are now chroniclers of our age, and TikTok, the Chinese are just stealing all our information. So, you know, leaving out that aspect of it, what, well, who else does this, or what else is doing this? Well, I, I should, I guess, talk about myself and my art. I'm an environmental artist, and I've taken this form of this is the change that I see most important to make because it crosses all of, um, all race, all countries. We're one earth, we're one people. And if we can get people to change their behavior and reduce carbon, we will have a lot less of this unrest. So it's massive, but through art, we can cut through the words. For instance, um, when I started, I was at World Book and I was putting out environmental statements there. And we used the word global warming, right? We well, couldn't use that word within 10 years. It became too politicized. Now we have climate change because it's hot and cold. And, but we knew in 1979 with the Jasons what was going to happen 30 years from now. And to live it and know that we haven't changed it is shocking to me. At the same time, if we're that we were that right in 79, what we have up ahead of us is apocalypse. Yeah, I mean, we see it in movies. And I do think that the environmental statement is coming out left and right in films. For instance, the One Earth Film Festival, I got but a big plug in. They are uh, starting their uh, film festival. It's going to be March 3rd through 12th. One Earth Film Festival. It is both streamed and there'll be there's 15 films this year selected from 330 new films. It will be streamed online nationally, as well as be in different sites, Navy Pier, University of Illinois at Chicago, Oak Park Library usually always has it. It came out of Oak Park, but it's now national. And that message is for people to sit together, watch the film, and then have a conversation right after. And usually they're action tables, when it was in person, now it's more hybrid. Action tables of what you can do based on this film to go out in the world and change. And you know, it's stickers in the windows to keep the birds from cra crashing into windows. Or it's, um, you know, this is how you can invest. Or this is how you can put in solar. You know, some action you can take after it. But that's what I've taken on, and I'm on this, uh, national, international group called EcoArt, and we share information with each other, and it keeps me pushing towards it in um, 
uh, a more energized way. But I started off, I was um, in college, I studied biology and literature and art, and that's where I learned to sculpt. And so it's meshing now into this one place where art and science and literature are all coming together. And um, I think the message is extreme. So I have a web page that's called Green Blocks Initiative. And green it's to blocks. change what Green blocks, blocks Initiative. The idea is it goes, it's go, gone out nationally already and into Canada. And people say what they're doing in each city and from that, we hope there'll be a kind of blocks that grow out of it, like a ripple effect, and that people will share with their, their community what they're doing to reduce carbon. That's our first thing. There's a whole lot of aspects to it, but if we can reduce carbon emissions, we can allow the oceans to heal. That'll keep our weather from being so volatile. Um, that'll keep people from being so volatile, you know, so it, I kind of see it building that way. And also, if we take action in every way we can, then we will feel like we have some, agency. we're making some change. Agency. Yeah, agency, right. So do you want to tell us a little bit, I don't know if you have time to do this this afternoon, but about your own art. Is it representative art, symbolic art? How did your own work as a sculptor sit in this nexus of art and science and politics and climate change. I mean, where are you in that mix? Uh, well, yeah, so um, human, plant, and animal, and the interconnection between those, that we are all interconnected. We all, like, every form of carbon needs each other. Um, so I sculpt people, and in some cases, Gwendolyn Brooks, it's Lois Barrett Campbell, a gospel singer, it's leaders that have risen up and in some way made a difference. Mm -hmm. And I've done this since high school, really. You know, just people and individuals are important. And it's not always a well-known person. And then, uh, but the Gwendolyn, but the monuments in Chicago are Monsignor John Egan, fought for social justice. The piece is actually called, What Are You Doing for Justice? Soka Gakkai Monument that's in the Peace Garden of Lincoln Park. That is a black boy playing with a white boy after a 50-year effort for uh, racial equality by Daikaru Ikeda, Daisaku Ikeda, out of Japan. And uh, he, he established what he was gonna do with leading a lay Buddhist organization, Soka Gakkai. He established his whole philosophy in an incident in Lincoln Park that that sculpture is representing, where the black boy could not play with the white boys, and everybody chased him for laughing at a mistake one of the white boys made. And that was in 1960, and this, this sculpture is dedicated to the 50 years between that incident and how much change has been made since. Um, I also have one of Gwendolyn Brooks, which is, I think, the most seen piece. Over three million people have viewed it on Google Maps, which is my only marker. It's in, on 46 in Greenwood. Not many people have seen it in person, but it's gotten out there through imagery. Um, and we have an annual, at least one, sometimes three to five, poetry workshops to perpetuate her life work. And that's with kids, teens, um, adults, elderly. What you know, just come and write poetry and know what she was trying to express and how hard it is to get to the point of what you want to make. Thank you. I'm a student at Chicago State University, and uh, they recently had the Green Library going to the library. So to be your father having uh, a connection uh, to what you in Brooklyn and then you being inspired by her is really like a nice uh, vision of what you're speaking about how your father wanted people to connect to make change and I think this is you know you all were talking about social media and things like that I think this is still uh, act on preservation in terms of connecting generation and generation so that people can be inspired to use social media as a platform 
to continue that preservation. So, yeah. Thank you. Well said again. Yeah. 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 Thank you. I think this has been extremely rich. Thank you so much for your questions, your comments. What a great Mark. conversation. Well, <laughs> thank you. Yes, really, really. And thank you so, so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.